Welcome to Living a Full Life Podcast. Join us as we explore health topics that encourage raising healthy children, living a healthy life, and living the best life possible. Now, here's your host. Hello and welcome to another podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Enrico Dolcicori. Thanks for joining me. I want to wish you all a happy new year. This one will be a great one, I hope, for everyone. The focus on this week's podcast is going to be the 2000 calorie diet. Where did it come from? Why does it exist? And really, what has it done to the culture of food and consumption over the last 30 plus years? Before we get into that, the new year usually brings in a lot of New Year's resolutions. And the reason why we're talking about the 2000 calorie diet, diet, is because diet is the number one resolution pretty close to, you know, the losing weight and improving fitness. So the most popular resolutions every year are, you know, I'm going to exercise more, I'm going to lose weight, uh, I'm going to save money, and I'm going to improve my diet. Those are the most popular um, New Year's resolutions. The gyms are all going to be full the next couple weeks. Um, the, the gym membership rates increase. It's hard to find a personal trainer this time of the year. Um, all those things are starting to fill up. And uh, by February, 56% of all new gym members stop going to the gym or drastically reduce their visits to the gym. And by February, you know, Valentine's Day, we're, we're eating chocolate. And most of our diets are up in flames. And the point of this is to hopefully motivate the listeners to stick to the resolutions that you make, but more importantly, become educated and, you know, know the facts of what's going on. That's the whole point of why I do this is to share facts, data, and research in the most advanced way we can, in in the most uh, digestible way we can. So that's my goal, and that's what we hope to get through here. So the 2,000-calorie diet, uh, where did it come from? Why do we follow it? Uh, Why does it even exist? It's all part of a labeling act that the U.S. Drug Administration passed in, uh, you know, the USDA passed in 1990. They all decided to come together and replace what was called the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, the FDCA Act the Federal Drug and Cosmetic Act was in place prior to that and it didn't really address any statistics or facts that people could follow through. So a committee got together and decided, hey, we need to make labeling a priority because people need to know what they're eating, what they're purchasing, what's in the the cosmetics that they're buying, the ingredients that are there, the percentages that are there. It was an important uh, act and, and bill to pass because... It made um, industries and companies liable for the ingredients that they were using. We're going to use the the food portion of this as to, you know, what has happened with that. And literally, the 2,000-calorie diet came from surveys. There was really no research used behind it. They just surveyed the American people, whoever decided to fill out this survey. They would put their age and sex, and that was it. That's what it was based on. And the average male reported eating 2,000 plus calories a day, and the average female about 1,600 calories per day. So this committee got together and said, you know what, we're going to keep it simple. Americans, you know, got to keep things simple for them, nice rounded number, and we're going to make all of our labeling standardized off that. Kind of crazy if you think about it, since we want to use research and data and be specific Why is something so simple plastered across an entire industry, especially food and what we consume? And it's perplexing when you think about it. Because here we are 30 years later, nothing has really changed, yet we know so much more about metabolism and how the body works compared to, you know, 1985. So it's really changed society's conception of food. And... We have to go back before this and understand, you know, where does the breakdown of food come from? We know that the macronutrients of food are proteins, fats, carbohydrates. There are other macronutrients like fiber and alcohol that can be 
made within foods that we eat and fermenting fruits and can produce alcohols and they can have alcohols in it. Like some of the fruits that you eat that might be extra ripe and super sweet might have a little small percentage of alcohol in it that your body metabolizes when it eats. You don't even notice it like a really ripe peach or uh, ripe strawberries. So there's other parts to that. But the micronutrients are the things that we talk about, the vitamins, the minerals, the components of the food that gives us the nutrition we need to be vital and healthy and survive and, and feed our bodies to function in the highest level possible. But it's these macronutrients that they focused on and they said, how are we going to figure out, you know, how to how to calculate what calories are in a food? So the calorie is really a heat study that's used where you take food and put it into a, a compressed area with water in it. And you start pumping in oxygen to it, which combusts the food, whatever it is, a piece of banana or whatever it may be. And then they just calculate the time it takes to raise the temperature of the water by one degree Celsius. And that's really it. And then they know the components of that banana has uh, mostly carbohydrate. And then they can say, well, you know, it, for every for every calorie that of energy that was used to burn that, we know that there's four grams of carbohydrates in that. And that's and that's where you get this energy production down. And you know, researchers don't even like that method. And we've still used it for over a hundred years of how the calorie works. So we base this entire notion of healthy eating on a very abstract method of thinking. And it's perplexing because we have come so far in a hundred years. Why are we still doing it like this? Then we then we generalized food and the calorie and energy in food and made a standardized label. So if you're perplexed as I am, good. We're both on the same page. The next point is why label all the food under these standards? And the Labeling Act goes much further than this. Of course, in 1990, processed foods um, were taking off in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. For, for about 30 years, processed foods were coming together. Cereals, packaged foods, packaged meats. Uh, the fresh farmer's market was dissipating. The farmer's markets were dissipating. And the grocery stores were taking over as uh, the easiest way to get food as the rural communities became more urban and historically it just made more sense so the food industry wanted to take control of the you know food that we eat and it was so much easier to process food and calculate exactly what was in it and that's where the labels were meant for up to today you won't see a nutritional fact well on most packaging you won't see especially like chicken beef um organic products on, on the side of an apple, you may not see a label on it because it's really hard to determine the exact caloric intake or the cal calories in an exact apple. It's all based off weight and every different apple has a different saturation of sugars in it. And there's so many factors when it comes to organic food, meats, proteins, vegetables, fruits. Uh, it, it's tough, but processed foods, boy, can you control that. So the whole point of the label was really for processed foods, to put a label on the side of a box or a can so that you knew exactly what was in it. Uh, when you pick up an apple, you pretty much know the ingredients in an apple. When you pick up an orange, you know the ingredients of an orange is an orange and an apple is an apple. However, when you pick up a box of pancake mix, you may not know all the ingredients in there. It's not just salt, flour, and some cornstarch. Typically, they add a lot of ingredients to it. So that's the history of the label. The point of the 2,000 calorie diet was to simplify the American diet for most people to stay within a caloric limit to limit weight gain. That's the whole point of that. That's staying within a 2,000 calorie diet. But however, when we look at the research, the 2,000 calorie diet makes no sense at all. It is not a standard for anything. Because if you truly could eat 4,000 calories a day of vegetables, let's say you're a vegetarian, and you eat 4,000 calories a day mainly of vegetables, um, you wouldn't gain any weight. You'd actually probably lose weight in general because of the amount of energy it takes to consume that much vegetable. Does that make sense? And you would never be able to build up enough um, components or macronutrients to start a fat synthesizing process in your body. Your metabolism would be great. 
So it's really hard to differentiate, sorry, differentiate that. So that's where the diet comes from of the 2000 calorie. And I hope you will just scrap that whole idea of following the 2000 calorie diet because it's just not based on any solid grounds. So when we talk about eating healthy, it's really way past calories and macronutrients. What we want to be looking at is whole foods. And we want to be looking at basing our entire consumption of food per day based around whole foods. Whole foods give us everything that we need all in the micronutrient and macronutrient variation. If we stick to meats, vegetables, and fruits, proteins, carbs, and fats, we pretty much get everything we need. It's just having a variety of those things is what makes the best diet. Okay, Diet is really a short-term product. When we decide to diet, we, we, we're going to do this for a short term to reach a certain goal. Diets are not lifelong. Um, those, are, those are life choices that we make, and we plan around those. So the, the most popular diets that are out there are the keto di- ketogenic diet, the Mediterranean diet, the paleo diet, the Whole30 diet, the vegan diet, and the raw food diet. And those are, those are the most popular ones that are out there. And I've been able to lecture and do workshops on many of these, the raw food diet, the vegan diet, the Whole30 diet, the paleo diet, the Mediterranean diet, and even the ketogenic diet and the chirothin diet. Uh, and they all follow the same premises. I got really big into lecturing into this you know, over 10 years ago because it made such a revolutionary shift in my dad's health when he was diagnosed with cancer. And we started with the raw food diet at that time. And we said, Dad, listen, these are your options uh, for cancer. You can, you can use the oncology, you can use the chemotherapy, you can use the radiation, you can keep doing what you're doing, or you can keep those on, on deck And you can start making a drastic change right now. So long story short, he switched into the raw food diet immediately. Saw a naturopath, got chiropractic care, all that good stuff. IV therapy, all natural food. And and bombarded his body with vitamins and minerals and eating just raw food. Which meant he pretty much cut out meat for, for a short term. So he would eat fruits and vegetables. Everything would be raw. And he'd blend a lot of things, and in the blender, he'd throw his vitamins in there too. And in in 99 days, he lost 41 pounds and uh, was cancer-free. He had stage 3 colon cancer at that time. He did a lot of things. This is another podcast for another time, which is coming very soon. But that's what got the raw food diet and, and, and motivated me to teach my patients, okay, listen, this is what we did. We started teaming up with local chefs and... Uh, and restaurants, and we, we preached the raw food diet and the anti-cancer diet, which then led into the vegan diet and, and vegetarian um, diets. But really, when we talk about whole food, we really do want to be eating, unless you truly are a vegetarian or a vegan, that's absolutely fine. You want to follow the whole food diet, just minus meats, which works really well. We want to follow a paleo or whole 30 type diet or Mediterranean style diet because they are the basis to the healthiest ways to eat. So everything in moderation is the best way to get everything you need. And it gets very boring to eat the same three meals every single day. So variety makes life fun. And that's what eating should be about. When we eat, we should be fulfilling a nutritional void that the body needs every single time. And it's not 2,000 calories. It doesn't come to 2,000 calories. The, the whole labeling thing was to help people understand that, you know, a cheeseburger, fries, and an ice cream is, you know, 2,900 calories. So if you knew that and you consumed all that in one sitting, that should, you've exceeded what you should eat for the day in calories. And, and that is true on that basis of junk food. But really, when it comes to good food and a Mediterranean or a whole food diet, eating 2,500 calories doesn't mean you're going to gain weight. And eating 1,500 calories doesn't mean you're going to lose weight either. Uh, the Calorie In, Calorie Out, that's a great book as well. It pretty much breaks down what calories are. I don't like it because it's not that simple. 
simply they try to simplify the whole idea and the book does go into the details of how it is not that simple but but that's a good book as well calories in calories out and it goes in into into what calories really are so I think what we've done the labeling industry has really the labeling act has really changed the food industry and the social component that we have as a, such a, as a society to how we eat and that's the biggest problem there and that's that's the PSA of this podcast is what do we do uh, moving forward for that and it's really understanding how to eat and if we stick to whole foods that's where we get most of our nutrition from and we just need a variety of that now people say you know what should I stay away from what should I eat and the dense carbohydrates is what turns on insulin in the body or helps uh, makes your pancreas create more insulin to help break down excess sugars that we eat and that's why high carbohydrate diets usually lead to weight gain is because of the excess insulin in the body and what that does uh, over a long period of time is consistently eating too much grain or carbohydrates or, or simple carbs all the time it makes us insulin resistant and then your pancreas can't keep up and then you automatically default from burning calories in the body in your metabolism to storing calories storing fat and that's where we get the excess weight gain that can happen through diet and that's why Americans actually undereat over the age of 40 undereat don't eat enough food per day and can still gain weight is because they've wrecked the metabol the metabolism process in their body and now the increase of continuous caloric intake from carbohydrates actually puts on the weight not fat so another myth buster was you know fat back in the 80s and 90s being bad and the low fat diet that came out with that and labeling things as low fat and making those popular south beach diet and all those fad diets that came out there saying that fat was bad again only fueled the fire to the carbohydrate diets and sugar and uh, allowing us to continue to consume that pasta, bread, starch, all these things in high quantities is why the body will res reserve fat or sorry, reserve energy stores and turn them to fat is to uh, wait for a winter day where there is no food. And that was the, the biggest change there. So eating a whole food diet is going to be the best way to move forward and just making sure that vegetables, proteins, and fruits are, are part of every meal that you eat. Breakfast is one big social, um, social change that has happened thanks to Kellogg's and some of the big food corporations over the last 70, 80 years is that they changed the way we think. Cereal, pancakes, muffins, Pop-Tarts, um, these quick breakfasts replaced you know having steak and eggs in the morning what people used to do on the farm wake up warm up some leftover steak from last night fry an egg eat it for breakfast that, that was typically a high protein breakfast that many farmers would start the day off with and they changed it and made it very convenient to just open a box and pour some milk in there and um, change the entire breakfast scheme if you travel, if you get the opportunity to travel anywhere else in the world, breakfasts are different. Um, but you have to go out to the non-touristy spots to really sense that. Uh, because hotel chains around the world make the continental breakfast the standard everywhere. So you got croissants, toast, peanut butter, uh, and carbohydrates for breakfast. So we've really changed the way we think about food but you got to erase the 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 branded stuff that has been created and go right back to a whole food diet as you can see i'm not picking picking one specific diet at all because they all base right if you look at the mediterranean diet that's a whole food diet as well plant-based seeds herbs seafood that's the staple of the mediterranean diet eating you know fish um great uh olives olive oil getting good fats from seeds nuts uh, meats and then filling the rest of your plate with vegetables and fruits that's the mediterranean diet the paleo diet 
says to just eat fruit, vegetable, and meat. The whole food, the whole thirty diet, same thing, but with eggs, dairy, and then the ketogenic diet is pretty much scrapping carbs altogether, which I'm not a big fan of long term, for many different reasons. Um, so as you go into the new year and you create your own goals for this year, make them organic. That's the best. That should be the word of 2023 for you is organic. Everything that you decide to buy, everything that you decide to put into your body, organic. And I don't mean the the grocery store or organic where you go in there and you're like, okay, I'm going to buy organic apples instead of or non-organic apples. <clears throat> and you should. You absolutely should. But the organic um, shopper spends a lot more than the non-organic. So not feasible for every single person listening, but the, the word you need to focus on is organic. What did my great-great-great-grandmother eat? That's probably what I should eat from the farm, from the land, what was produced. And think before grocery stores. Think before the convenience of the center aisles of boxes and cans and packaging. And really, the produce section and the meat section, that's really where you should be spending most of your time and most of your dollars feeding yourself and your family. If you start with that and you and you base around that, you've got a good foundation to a healthy diet that you're going to teach your kids healthy habits for the rest of their life as well. Does it mean you cannot have cake and have the candy and have the thing? You can. But remember, we celebrate things to celebrate things. You don't celebrate Tuesdays every Tuesday. You know, Taco Tuesdays or you know, cake every Tuesday or pancake Tuesday. There's no such thing. Shouldn't be a thing like that. We celebrate with sugar because we had time to sit down and ha- and bake something or cook something or or celebrate a birthday. You can absolutely do those things and you can enjoy things, but I think we have to turn off the, you know, reward systems that we were taught as kids is when we have good behavior, we'll go out and get an ice cream or we'll go to McDonald's or we'll get chicken nuggets or we'll do these things because they translate throughout our entire life as an adult that we need to reward ourselves after, you know, simple tasks. A long day at work, I'm tired, I'm going to have wine, cheese, crackers, potato chips and some Snickers bars. That's, that's the issue because you're going to have a long day at work five days a week and you're going to end each day with a pint of ice cream and potato chips and and that's where that's where trouble happens is just having these as the staple and then you wake up the next morning and you're lethargic and you skip breakfast and you got to grab the 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 breakfast thing from the from the local restaurant on your way to work and you know that's not healthy because it's a croissant and And then you got your sugary drink, coffee in the morning, and then it just turns into this, you know, I'm going to get a sandwich for lunch, and then you get home, you're like, I'm just going to boil up some water and cook some spaghetti. And you then realize how the carbohydrate diet starts to take over. America has a carbohydrate problem and a process problem, not a food problem. We have a a social issue with food, and we need to change that, that mind frame by understanding what food is, what we need, and and what is best for ourselves and our families to live a healthy life. Food is thy medicine. You've heard that many, many times. Moving into this year, whatever your resolutions are, even if you skip the resolutions, good for you. Um, Because you should always make a change whenever you need to make a change. But don't wait until your health has taken a hit. That's when I see patients scrambling and wanting to make a change, like my father, for example. It took a stage three cancer diagnosis for him to finally change his ways. And he's lucky he made it. <clears throat> so some of us are not. And that's the whole motivation behind this podcast. Some great podcasts coming up. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being part of this. Share this, like this, you know, follow us. Um, I know my voice is not the most listenable, but... The, the content is. The content is good. We got a uh, naturopath doctor coming up, an oncology naturopathic doctor, Dr. Colin Race, coming up here in the next couple of weeks. And we'll dive deep into oncology and cancer and food. That's going to be great. Hence why I brought up my dad's story. And you're going to hear my dad over the next few weeks on the next few podcasts because I think it's going to tell a nice story, putting it all together and what health really is, what diet does. And what cancer can do mentally, physically, and emotionally to someone as well. So stay tuned for all that. 
Have a great week. Take care. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Living a Full Life Podcast. If you're enjoying the show, please feel free to rate, subscribe, and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. That helps others find the show, and we greatly appreciate it. Thanks again for tuning in, and we'll catch you in the next episode.